Training camp will be here before you know it. That means position battles, the topic that we're going to go over on today's edition of the Audible Cecil Lammy Sigmund Bloom. And we know that Brock Purdy is the starter. We know that Brock mm-hmm. Purdy is working with quarterbacks and he's like a quarterback coach and he's like, you know, working his way back, Bloom. But there's actually a competition that a lot of people around the 49ers feel that Sam Darnold is ahead of Trey Lance. This is something to watch in training camp, to be sure. It is. I suppose if you're looking for evidence, and I don't think there is evidence, affirmative evidence, that Trey Lance can't play, or Trey Lance is a bust, or the 49ers don't believe in Trey Lance. The 49ers, Kyle Shanahan has been trying to avoid playing Trey Lance, okay? Hey, playing a quarterback who got one throw from winning the Super Bowl, who's fluent in the offense over a rookie, even a rookie that you traded up to take number three, that doesn't mean that you hate the rookie, that he gets into the building. You're like, what did we do? Oops. No. Trey Lance didn't play enough last year to say, oh, yeah, look, he can't play. Now, Brock Purdy played enough last year to say he can play. Uh, but if Trey Lance can't beat out Sam Darnold, and look, we can say Sam Darnold, Cease, as you've often referred to, at a time, the 49ers, Kyle Shanahan, were hot and heavy for Darnold. And right. it wasn't that it Matt could... Barrows that said this might be the most talented passer Kyle's ever had. Right. And we love Matt. Right. Barrows. Right. And, you know, see, there's a larger conversation here that's interesting about quarterbacks and what are the things that get you drafted high and what are the things that make you succeed in the NFL? Not the same things. Right. right? Not right. the same things. You can have all the tools and traits in the world. But without the processor, without a way to interface with very difficult to solve NFL defenses, without uh, alignment with philosophy, scheme, play designs, you're never going to unlock those traits. You're never going to unlock those tools. So Sam Darnold, as we've seen at different stops, and you can't just say it was the Jets, right? It wasn't just the Jets. At different stops, Sam Darnold has not looked like an NFL starting quarterback. Now, we may have to allow for irrational uh, thoughts in the building that it overinflate Darnold's worth because of what you told us in the past, Cease, that they were willing to give up a first round pick for him at one time as not just a reclamation project, but obviously that's not a reclamation project. Yeah, that's your that's starter. The, <laughs> that's your starter. Exactly. So, uh, but otherwise Trey Lance, if he is playing like a quarterback that deserved to go in the top five, if he's practicing like a quarterback that deserved to go in the top five, then he should be able to beat out Sam Darnold. And I've also seen the other thing about this that's really interesting, Cease, and I suppose that this has been a motif since the moment the 49ers traded up and Chris Sims, who has Kyle Shanahan's name tattooed on, is this like his calf or something like that? Yeah, it's his initials. Yeah, they all yeah, four initials. of them have their initials on their body. Yep. So he immediately said, it's Mac Jones. Mac Jones, that's the guy. Mac Jones, right? So the interesting thing about this entire situation is that from the moment that we entered into the football universe where the 49ers are trading up for a quarterback instead of just letting their system make the quarterback, we've had all of these dissenting, conflicting accounts of what's happening. And even in this case, I've seen some items that say, no, no, Trey Lance is comfortably ahead of Sam Darnold. Who knows what to believe? But I do know that with the NFL rules now, the third quarterback can dress but isn't active unless the other two quarterbacks get hurt. Is that right? Yes. change in the rules yes so we're gonna see really you know who the 49ers want as their backup assuming brock purdy is ready for week one and if brock purdy's not ready for week one we're gonna see who's gonna start so we're gonna get evidence but i think that ha- leading with this item first of all is important because this is consequential for fantasy football trey lance if he starts is an instant top 10 fantasy quarterback and yes. he's not even getting drafted see so i've done some drafts he's not even getting drafted wow in some drafts which is just i'm sorry that's wrong i mean if we're understanding fantasy football and why and what we're looking for that's wrong but at the same time sam darnold's the backup of trey lance is the number three maybe it's right yeah maybe uh you know how to know what's going on in san francisco talk to more than one person anyway yeah. <laughs> it is definitely two that work together and kyle and john lynch so that's that's a good good process for the 49ers we'll see how it works out bloom on our football guys newswire which i urge everyone to sign up for at footballguys.com it's free daily newswire all the hot stories right to your inbox every morning you've got a life we don't it's football guys daily newswire you wrote about hunter renfro trade 
Like yeah. what? Like that's what uh, I think was Victor Fur from the Athletics yeah. saying like there might be a Hunter Renfro trade. Well, that's going to open up some competition with the Las Vegas Raiders. We're already worried about Devonte Adams and how long he's going to be there because he doesn't like what the front office is doing. And now they might trade or they possibly could trade Hunter Renfro. Um, okay, get ready for some moves. Uh, come August, everybody. Yeah, I think that we can really see so we can uh, put in this Hunter Renfro situation. And look, Vic Tafer, uh, somebody, if you're listening out there and you want an interesting project, you want something to put your name on that people will read and share, somebody should make a list of all the NFL beat writers and how long they've been tenured with their team and maybe how long they've been an NFL beat writer have been covering the NFL. Vic Tafer, that's how you say your name, Vic, um, if you're listening, uh, he's been covering the Raiders for what, see, he's like, over a decade right 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 he's been i mean he's not jerry mcdonald a lot of bull alum love jerry uh but he's been covering this team for a long time so when he and Tashawn reed who's an outstanding writer uh they both cover the raiders for the athletic las vegas sports hotbed uh they had their projected 53-man roster and vic left runter renfro off not because he thinks he's going to get cut but because he thinks that he's going to get traded and I think that this is just one of those situations where uh, oh, there's over exuberance with the, the extension. Again, wide receiver hysteria, uh, where we saw running backs now reaching a trough, a low point in their market right now. Wide receivers topped out in that offseason that Devonta Adams got paid and Tyreek Hill got paid and, and so on. And Hunter Renfro got a ridiculous amount of money from the Raiders, which may be a problem be, when it comes to trading him because he's due a $6.5 million base salary, which isn't even close to what his actual cash per year cost was for the Raiders. It was north of $10 because he had a four-plus million roster bonus this year. Uh, but is run to Renfro even worth $6.5 million to a team that doesn't really have a lot of cap space and would have to uh, delay some pain to the future? I think one of the things that this highlights for me, Cease, is how important Jacoby Myers is going to be for this offense either way. If Hunter Renfro is not seen as essential, there is a little bit of overlap in their roles, although Myers can play outside also. Uh, but then when you look past Hunter Renfro, we're looking at DeAndre Carter, Philip Dorsett, Keelan Cole, Cam Sims. That's actually who Vic has making the team with Hunter Renfro. As being the dealt. sixth wide receiver, yeah. As the sixth wide receiver, yeah. So not a lot of guys. I mean, not a lot of proven guys, a lot of role players not someone who would really be thrust into the spotlight. And I think that I, I, that highlights for me that Jacoby Myers is going to be an important player and Michael Mayer is probably going to play right away. You have OJ Howard uh, still trying to get something out of that first round pick because this team is going to want to go to tight end if possible. Uh, but the overall thing you spell out here is potential disaster. What's the Morse code for SOS? Do, 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 do. That's what I get from the Raiders offense with or without Hunter Renfro. Special Morris code shout out. Uh, Bloom, Roshan Johnson is a player that I love and it doesn't help. <laughs> I guess it does help. Doesn't help. Uh, I mean, it doesn't temper my excitement when Bears head coach Matt Eberfluss says, quote, he's really going to take off, close quote, yeah. when training camp begins. So, yes, I love Khalil Herbert, though. So it's like two loves, and I'm like, oh, man, I wish they weren't on the same team. Right. So how's this position battle going to shake out? My knee-jerk reaction ceases is in a way that we're not going to be happy with for fantasy football. Yes. In a way that's probably good for the Bears. Uh, however, I think that as we lay these three out, you have Khalil Herbert, who's the most explosive. You have Dante Foreman, who's the most physical and rugged. And then you have Rashawn Johnson, who's the most versatile and the best pass blocker. So it, it's really easy to see this as a three-headed committee and one that who's going to get the most work? Well, how's the game going? How's the opponent playing? What's the score? What was the score at halftime, right? Is the team having to pass more and be in more passing situations? Or is the team putting the lean on the opponent and Dante Foreman's going to be the bow constrictor at the end? Uh, obviously injuries are going to play in. So I don't want to warn people away from the Bears backfield and say, don't draft any of these Bears running backs because week to week, you're not going to have, it's just spinning the roulette wheel. And maybe it's going to hit and maybe it's not uh, because injuries can clarify this, right? And that's what we're going to watch in training camp, especially if it's an injury to a rookie in this case with Johnson. Now, that being said, Cease, you said Johnson's exciting. 
And what's exciting about Johnson is he's the one of the three that can be a three down back. And he's also the one that has this latent upside. Uh, Cease, can I just rant for a second here? This is not a Go midnight rant. This is a, a 10, 21 minute rant. Stop saying, how is this guy going to succeed in the NFL if he couldn't beat out whoever in college? Stop it. Wait, Stop who it. says that? That's dumb. Like Terrell That's Davis really was a dumb. fullback at Georgia. Willie Parker was a backup at North Carolina. Like how many right. examples do we have? Joe Montana was the ninth string quarterback at Notre Dame when he first showed up. Yeah. Like, Stop come it. on, everybody. Stop it. Rashawn Johnson was behind B. John Robinson, right? Super so if he wasn't, if he wasn't behind B. John Robinson, well, who knows? I mean, look at Tony Pollard. It doesn't even have to be that the guy you were playing behind was a top 10 pick. Sometimes coaches are just irrational in college. Sometimes players go through the transfer portal. Joe Burrow sees there's a universe. There's a football universe where Joe Burrow did not start a game in college, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. Joe Burrow, who widely is considered one of the five, six, seven best quarterbacks in the NFL on the planet. Uh, if he hadn't transferred to LSU, we might not have seen him play in college. So, by the way, congratulations, LSU national champions. Baseball. It's baseball season. Oh, OK. I was going to say, like, <laughs> what's going on here? All right. Well, let's. <laughs> Let's change it to something I do know because it is a Broncos show and position battles abound because I believe I can't tell you. I uh, here's here's the way I found Bloom. Wink oh, wink and Morse nod, code nod and Lassie Bark. Yes, Morse code. I wish I could tell you that Cortland Sutton was super explosive and taking the top off the defense for Russell Wilson and Sean Payton's offense. I wish that Jerry Judy wasn't going to be asked to run corner routes and post routes, and he's just going to run what he's good at, which is out routes and drag routes and screen passes. I wish I could tell you that Russell Wilson's timing in this offense looks really good. I can't tell you any of those things, you know, and those are just guesses. I'm just saying, but we have a position battle in Denver between all these damn wide receivers yeah. because I think Jerry Judy loves, or excuse me, Sean Payton loves Jerry Judy. I believe that Sean Payton is coaching up Jerry Judy in a way maybe only Nick Saban did. I believe Jerry Judy, and I have been told that the frustration isn't from him like checking out when he's not the backside X, which has always been my theory. Like if he's not the number one read, he just doesn't care. Um, I've been told by people I trust that like he's frustrated with losing, man. <laughs> like, okay, so get some wins, everything. And, and Sean Payton's loving him up. He's loving him up, Bloom. Loving him up. But Cortland Sutton will not go away. I mean, his, he looks more explosive than ever. To me, my observation. Oh, by the way, Tim Patrick is a dog. And he's there as well. Marvin Mims is a little bit banged up. But anyway, like, all right, how's this thing going to work out in Denver? I guess, uh, I guess I better have my notepad ready, Bloom. Yeah. We have so many different changing variables here. You mentioned Sean Payton. Uh, should improve the efficiency of the offense. However, all the signs point towards a more run-heavy offense. Yes. You have Russell Wilson, right? How, is Russell Wilson going to be improved? Was it really just Nathaniel Hackett? Because Russell Wilson was productive whenever the play caller changed late last year. Outen, right? Yeah, just an Outen. He, and he's with the, the Titans now as a running backs coach, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that's a, and also Jerry Judy crushed in those games, right? So if uh, Russell Wilson is better, that's going to improve per attempt passing efficiency, although the passing attempts should go down. Then you have the personnel. And I think it's not a classic position battle, Cease, where it's who's first, second, third on the depth chart. It's just who's going to shine in this offense. And like you said, starting to talk about the form the players are in and what they're going to be asked to do in their role and whether that is a, something that they're strong at doing. And then with Jerry Judy, it's yet to be seen. Uh, how do we sort all this out for fantasy? I think where we have uncertainty and there is a lot of uncertainty, not only uncertainty, but it, it's going to be fluid. It could be one way in September. And then what they learn in September could inform what they do in October, mm -hmm. right? Jerry Judy's the most expensive by a long shot. Cortland Sutton, is a forgotten man. Tim Patrick not even getting drafted. Marvin Mims, I don't think people like Marvin Mims to draft rookie. Who did he get drafted by? We're in late June. People aren't even remembering that Marvin Mims is going to be attached to this offense yet. Some people haven't even got caught up when it comes to even early drafters. So, or otherwise, they're underestimating Mims' potential role. 
So I think the most important thing here is to be agile mentally for fantasy football and ready to change as you hear the news change, as if you got someone there in camp like we do, who wishes they could tell you things, maybe your wishes will be granted. Right. Uh, but if Jerry Judy is the most expensive, if you're drafting Jerry Judy in the third round, I'm seeing him go in the third round, you're drafting him in his ceiling. You're drafting him in his ceiling unless he gets, what, 30% of the targets? Is there any possible way, Cease, that any receiver in this offense is going to get 30% of the targets? Unless someone gets traded, no. Yeah, which, um, okay. Which Carl Sutton might Injuries get traded. Mm -hmm. Right, which would actually be both, uh, free both, right? So yeah, I think that the most important thing here is to have an open mind. But if you're drafting today, if you're doing early drafts, where there's uncertainty, go for the bargain options and go for the option that maybe has regained, recaptured his form, and that would be Cortland Sutton. What happens with New England's receivers, and does it even matter? Because it yeah. seems like there's some drum beats that I'm kind of like skeptical about. The Tutu Atwell drum beat is like, okay, okay, I get it. Enough, buddy, enough. But yeah. there's the Tyquan Thornton one where I was like, well, okay, yeah, I got to see it. Um, New England's not known to draft wide receivers. Thornton's getting a lot of good pub this year. He's learning more routes. Like, yeah, okay, he's fast. Knew that. He's a go-route guy in college, but that was it. And he was overdrafted last year but whatever your draft status doesn't matter just make plays so he's making plays and it makes me go huh i wonder how's that going to shake out new england and those wide receivers and then i go was it even going to matter right unless right. bailey zappy's the quarterback yeah perhaps <laughs> and it looks okay, don't new like england. mac jones i don't like mac jones he's a dirty player i don't think he's a good he's a quarterback heel. yeah he's a heel uh, okay uh the patriots at least they have an actual offensive coordinator in Bill O'Brien. So you'll come up, but what are we talking about here? Still a bottom 10. If you look at the personnel, there's somebody on the couch recently that I asked about the Patriots and they basically said, look at their, Mike Clay, I think, look at the depth chart. If you look at the personnel, how's this going to be anything but a bottom 10 offense? I don't care what kind of rabbits Bill O'Brien pulls out of his hat. I don't care if it's Zappy or Mac Jones or Malik Cunningham taking the snap on a jet sweep and throwing the ball because they moved him to wide receiver. Uh, I don't care. When you have this kind of personnel, also the offensive line, mm, you know, when you're relying on Riley Reef and Trent Brown as your tackles, as a wins down in Miami now, there's a lot of ways for this offense to not get better, even though it was terrible at times last year. So we cut wide receivers. See, there's a, we could do a whole tangent on DeAndre Hopkins. <laughs> DeAndre mm -hmm. Hopkins visited Tennessee and New England, and they're waiting. We're waiting. And they both they're waiting contracts. Yeah, and he must not have liked the contract or we wouldn't still be waiting. So I still think that in a betting market scenario, New England should be the favorite to land him. And with each passing day, he becomes a greater favorite. And that then would blow up the fantasy depth chart. But then you have Juju Smith-Schuster, who is not healthy yet, which may be part of the reason that the, Ra the Raiders, the Patriots are in on DeAndre Hopkins, okay? Then you have Tyquan Thornton, the explosive player. But when you think Mac Jones, when you think this offense, do you think explosive plays? Probably not. I think Thornton in a best ball scenario makes sense because of his long speed. Um, Kayshawn Booty apparently can't play, by the way. So we can, Demario Douglas, who Cecil was telling you about, all, go all the way back to our Shrine Game show. 7-Eleven. Demario Douglas. Yeah, 7-Eleven, always open. He's an interesting player. Uh, Kendrick Bourne is still there. You know, th they're... But this is not a group, even with DeAndre Hopkins, that makes you think this offense is going to excel or turn the corner. So, yes, there's a position battle here. Yes, we still aren't exactly are sure who's going to be the final list of players in it. But I am sure that I don't think the Patriots are going to make a lot of difference in your fantasy league outside of maybe Ramondre Stevenson. But the longer I talk about the Patriots, the less I want to draft Ramondre Stevenson. Now, uh, let's tie a bow on today's program with a discussion about the Washington wide receiver group and how things may turn out a little bit differently than expected. And Jahan Dotson could end up making a bit more noise yeah. than people think because they have talent. Um, they've got Eric Bieniemy, you know, making a name and doing stuff differently. OK, we all love Terry McLaurin, but don't discount what Jahan Dotson or even Curtis Samuel can do. Yeah. And see if there's a, a message to take out of this. And this goes back to our situation. Oh, Devontae Parker's still in New England, by the way. I almost forgot because if they sign Hopkins, he's probably going to get cut. Uh, 
where there's a new coach, a new coordinator, we just talked about those Denver, roles can change, size of roles can change, players that are were significant can become less significant, players that were overlooked can become looked. So yeah, uh, Jahan Dotson, as we've talked about last year, the things he was doing to make an impact weren't necessarily the things that got him drafted in the first round, which is really exciting. Scary. Really, really exciting. Mm-hmm. Scary even. So what's Eric Bieniemy's concept going to be for how to deploy these receivers, including Curtis Samuel? And honestly, because Ron Rivera keeps mentioning that Antonio Gibson's a receiver or was a receiver at Memphis, let's throw him in this mix in the passing game, right? So you have these pieces, and we're just going to be watching and listening for clues from Washington's camp of what Eric Bieniemy's plan is. But the way fantasy drafts have shaken out where it's Terry McLaurin and everyone else, it might not be that way this year for fantasy, which again, going back to the Jerry Judy tip, if I'm not sure how a wide receiver group is going to shake out, I'm not drafting the most expensive player in that group, especially when the quarterback is Sam Howell. Right. Um, I don't want to say this because it's kind of scary. And I don't want other analysts to make fun of me, which I don't care about. Um, I'm not saying Jahan Dotson is EB's Tyreek Hill. But, and what do we know about Sam Howe? He plays hero ball. <laughs> like, he's the best and worst of Baker Mayfield, basically. Yeah. Like, that's Sam Howe. So, like, you want to throw, and that's the way he was drafted. What Jahan Dotson was drafted for was that blur speed. He's a blur, everybody. And he was catching seven touchdowns last year. He was like a red zone guy. And he's little and he's super fast. Okay, take a super fast guy, make him your version of Tyreek Hill. Sounds about right. I think so, Cease. And and again, I can't emphasize this enough. Especially if you're listening to the show in June, you're watching us. If you're drafting best ball teams on underdog, right? If you're getting in on your football guys championship team, draft early. Don't listen to those people out there say wait to draft. After early, you get the values. We stare at this stuff for so long. We look at ADP for so long that we have an artificially narrow sense of the range of outcomes for these players, right? Because if you do drafts, Terry McLaurin is going to go in the fourth round. Maybe he'll fall to the fifth round. Maybe someone reaches for him in the third round. His actual range of outcomes is much larger than that. Likewise with Jahan Dotson. Jahan Dotson could be one of the breakout players of the season. We may look at the receivers from last year, that great class. Remember, Garrett Wilson, everyone's already drafting as if he's going to get 1,500 yards, right? Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Drake London, right? These guys, Traylon Burks. John Dotson could be the most valuable one of them all when the dust settles. And ADP doesn't reflect that right now. So maybe if you are putting together your best ball portfolio, getting some John Dotson shares makes a lot of sense. But also, again, when this news starts and we start getting the fire hose turns on subscribe to the football guys daily newsletter because we take the fire hose and we pour it in a nice glass and shake it up put a little umbrella in it for you (laughs) you know then uh we're gonna try to decipher this stuff for you because it's gonna change and if your mind isn't open to change you're gonna be left behind it is the audible Cecil Lammy, Sigmund Bloom. You can follow Bloom on Twitter. That's at Sigmund Bloom. I'm at Cecil Lammy. The show is at The Audible. We appreciate each and every one of you. You want to help us out? Help grow our YouTube channel by doing the like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that you never miss a vid. Hit the freaking like button and uh, watch the video to the end, please. I'll wrap it up quickly. Um, That helps the algorithm as well, our YouTube overlords. But we appreciate you for helping grow the channel and checking out Football Guys dot com he's sig i'm cease we are the audible until next time be safe be kind know that you are appreciated stay tuned and would you please stay frosty 